welcome everyone to our episode with Dan Weston, sports analyst uh, that started Sports Analytics Advantage. Thanks for coming on, Dan. No, thank you, Nako. I'm really, really looking forward to doing this. Excellent. All right, cool. Well, look, as always, you know, we'll start off with, you, with yourself. Tell us a bit more about your background. Yeah, so um, I grew up in Kent, massive sports fan from, from a young age, always been into to numbers, had a bit of a numbers background really from when I was a young child. Um, did like, yeah, I can remember like doing like Mensa IQ tests and stuff when I was really young, uh, but love sports, sport was my own passion. Um, yeah, um, now I've moved up to the northeast of England, so, so Durham would be my closest county ground in, in English cricket. Um, uh, education wise I got a degree in accounting and finance um, but moved into some unconventional roles after that uh, never really got that, that accounting job um, so yeah I've moved into some unconventional roles as I say like sports trading online poker uh, before moving into sports analytics eventually as well yeah awesome all right okay um, and when did you start your involvement with sport trading online poker and, and analytics yeah well I've been doing I've been doing that pretty much <laughs> Most most of my career really from the start really, um, so, but it's quite interesting to focus on online poker in particular because I think that there's a lot of parallels that you can draw with online poker comparing it to to sports analytics as well. So the main um, parallel that you would be able to draw the difference in terms of the two two different things would be efficiency. In so right. online poker when it first started there was a massive boom and there was a lot of really bad players online like in, <laughs> and they were called the fish the good players were called the sharks and and then as as time went on um the sharks ate all the fish and then the sharks ended up having to play each other and and and, and then it becomes more of like a zero sum game where where it's very difficult to beat each other but in sports when you compare that to sport it's it's completely different because while american sports is a lot more efficient in terms of like the recruitment models and stuff like that I think in, in football and to a greater extent even in cricket, it's it's much different. There's there's not much efficiency in terms of the recruitment market compared to American sports at least. And having seen how poker evolved from that <laughs> being completely inefficient to efficient in the space of like not even a decade, um, to see that happen in cricket, I think well, will happen eventually, but it might take longer than a decade, maybe like 20 years or something like that. Right. Okay, well, I guess the one thing that I took out of the first thing that you said there is I don't feel so bad about losing money on online poker now because I probably came in when it was just the sharks left. Yeah, there's 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 good people who spend like hours and hours and hours devoting their lives to like game theory optimal strategies and stuff like that with like machine learning and stuff. So so all the money will always rise to the top. Okay, so so if someone beats a lower level then they'll try a high level then they'll lose someone who's better than them and then eventually it just all progresses to the top and these are the guys who are doing like machine learning and stuff like that you know these are highly highly intelligent people making making big money out of it so they're just yeah yeah it's it's, it's very very difficult for like a recreational player to win on a long-term long-term basis and and also that kind of brings me on to another point about sample size as well because you know, it's easy, easy to get carried away and say, okay, well, I had a few, I won a few times at home games or a few times online or whatever, and and um, yeah, let's let's go. It must be really easy to make money. Well, no. Um, usually, you need like thirty thousand hands at least at a given level to work out if your, you know, what your expect expectation is at that level. And right. that this this is so interesting to compare to cricket, for example, because like some analysts confuse me a lot because they they'll they'll judge a guy's average on like that uh, against a different sort of particular bowling type for example on like 300 balls and i'm like how is that how is that fair to do that you know a, a, an average can can fluctuate wildly you know a couple of drops or, or, or edges that you know don't carry or whatever and, and suddenly you'd have had four four dismissals or more than what you actually would have had in that sample it's 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 really flawed to think of sample size in such a small number in cricket when you've got like in poker 30,000 hands you would look at you know it's completely completely different so there's there's a couple of you know good comparisons there and and, and some other stuff as well like play if you're playing against someone on a regular basis you have to mix it up you have to be a bit unpredictable because because and it's the same with cricket as well if you if you use a predictable strategy the whole time you're gonna 
you're going to be exploited eventually. And this is, is exactly the same. So there's so many kind of parallels and equivalents in, in, in across, the, across the two areas. Right. Okay. And how did your work um, within tennis and cricket start and, and how has it evolved over time? Yeah. So as time progressed, I was doing a lot of tennis modeling and one day I picked up Moneyball. <laughs> so um, okay. I'm sure, sure most, most listeners and re- um, viewers are, are familiar with that. Um, but if you're not, definitely recommend a copy. It's a really, really great read. Um, as, as I was working with a lot of tennis data already, I initially looked at that as a sport where I would, might be able to have some application with regards to working with coaches, players, stuff like that. Um, I built a model which calculated the average rate of improvement or decline of a player based on their age and ability profile. Um, end goal really was to assess which young players have got high potential, um, potential to you know, maybe they're playing like challenger level at the moment, which is like they're ranked outside the top 100, sometimes outside the top 200, and then work out which which players have got the potential to be like top 10, top 20 type players. Um, in addition, also I tried to uh, model um, optimal player scheduling, so that that was really with a view to predicting the expected ranking points and expected um, financial reward for them playing a particular tournament over another particular tournament. So, on the ATP tour, for example, there might be like a choice of three tournaments for a player to play in on, in a given week. Sometimes it challenges, it's even like six tournaments. So each tournament will have a different expected financial and ranking point reward for a player based on their ability, based on the opponent pool, based on the surface, based on the court speed, stuff like that. So you can go into quite a lot of detail with that. And um, it was, you, you, as a player, you can really gain quite a lot from having that kind of input. But um, when I pitched the the idea to a few like agents of players, players managers, um, they they really liked the idea, but the players weren't so keen because they like traveling to tournaments with their friends, and right. like you know they want to practice with their friends, they want to socialize in the evenings or whatever, and, and they're, they're not they're, they're, amazingly they weren't that interested in in efficient tournament planning. They were more interested in kind of just being with their mates, basically. Right. <laughs> yeah. And so so, so yeah. Practice. Oh, sorry. sorry, I was just going to say, in terms of you know the differences between tennis and cricket, and, and what you've noticed, like what have you noticed on the T Twenty cricket side? Yeah, so so again, there's kind of like those barriers to entry in, in cricket as well, but in a different way with the, compared to tennis. So so yeah, moving into cricket, um, I started building a player database. Um, after this is all after after the sort of trying to contact like tennis players and stuff like that, yeah. and. Um, yeah, I love cricket as a sport as well, so it seemed like a really good fit. Um, yeah, so I built player, player databases, and just as I was doing that, I kind of was watching more and more and more on cricket on TV and stuff, and realised that teams were making suboptimal decisions so often, and, and um, commentators kind of were blissfully unaware of it, or, or <laughs> willingly not calling them out on it, kind of thing as well. And yeah. there was a lot of there's a lot of like misconceptions. So like a guy might have be perceived by a commentator to be a, a devastating boundary hitter as a finisher or something like that and then I'll go through my database and see he's hit like 10% of ball space or boundaries in the last three years which is way below average so so there's a lot of misconceptions and, and maybe a lot of what, what you might call what they call it a lot it's called gambler's fallacy so it's mm. what it means is that you the human mind has a tendency to remember more notable events than the right. non-notable events so if if a player for example like he if he hit like 60 off 25 balls to win a match for, from an impossible position for his team 10 years ago, people will still remember that. Yeah. <laughs> but they don't remember the fact that he's hit 10% of bound, ball space of boundaries in the last three years. Yeah. So, so yeah, it's, it's, like a, it's a mistake that the, the, the human mind makes quite a lot. And, and so, yeah, I started doing that and just became increasingly obvious that teams were making you know, quite big strategic errors. And, and I, I thought I would build something to try and address those issues. but yeah I mean the problem is that the doors like almost locked shut with regards to to working with T20 teams worldwide and that, that's a major issue I mean I can remember sending I must have sent hundreds of emails and LinkedIn messages to pretty much every coach owner director of cricket general manager that I could possibly find details for yeah. and I probably got a reply to about five percent of the messages that I sent wow. so yeah um, and even then the answer was like thanks but no thanks pretty much always as well right um, and was that sort of quite recently in the last couple of years or was that more when t20 yeah. boomed in the last sort of say 10 years ago 
No, no, it's not not that not 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 so far back as that. So this is all really two, three years ago, probably. I would say that, that, that most of that most of that took place. Um, so yeah, I mean, you can see that it's really really difficult to get to get roles with teams in the end. Now, I've, even though now I've got a few consultancy roles with teams, I don't think the landscape has changed a great deal you know, mm. with regards to the general uptake in it. I think even though coaches. Um, teams in general have become more open to the usage of data. I think that still data analytics has got a lot way to go before it has a dramatic disruptive impact on on the cricket world, really. Right, okay. And within cricket, you know, you mentioned you've worked with a few teams. So who are a couple of the teams that you've, um, I guess, been able to work with? And, and I guess, are you an external consultant that, that comes in just for one tournament? Or, or what does a relationship usually look like? Yeah, so so yeah, external ex- consultant a lot of the time. So um, sometimes, like a, I w- I've worked with quite a few English counties. So what they might do is they might give me a bespoke demand. So so they might say, okay, well I want to look at um, particular type of overseas player, for example, you know, like a spin all rounder for the sake of argument. Uh, and and then they'll say, okay, well I want him to be able to bat in the top six or top seven, but have you know. For example, decent bowling numbers, high expectations to perform well in England, um, uh, stuff like that. And then I'll be able to apply filters to databases and look at and model some expected data as well to, to give them a short list of players that then they can find, uh, they can perform some more due diligence on. So they might want to look at, say, personality traits or, or um, uh yeah, you know, just, 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 then it's down to them after that. If I give them, like I say, a short list of six players, then, then they can they can do their own work after that. Um, there's other ways as well. So I've been doing some strategic planning for teams as well. So assessing their own squad and the mistakes that they've been making over the last few years and then looking to sort of give them drivers and targets to yeah. to, to hit next year kind of thing. Um, that was for the T20 Blast and, and obviously that was yeah, supposed to take place in the next like month or so. Yeah. Um, but but um, yeah, so looking at looking at where they fell, where they've done well, how they can address that, what 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 targets that they need to, to hit based on the numbers of qualifying teams in the past, stuff like that. So there's there's a lot of lot a lot of work that goes into that and also some advanced scouting as well. So um I might do like a, a dossier on an opponent, looking at their strengths and weaknesses, how the, the venue strengths, uh, weaknesses, stuff like that. So looking at whether you should go in there with a lot of spinners, how how where the effects of winning the toss, um, which which players on the opposition are weak against pace, which players are weak against spin, stuff like that, and and a complete overview and looking at some some tactics for for them as well. Uh, teams I've worked with, um, work with Birmingham. Uh, Phoenix in the hundred, um, so I'm data insights manager there. Um, obviously, although the tournament hasn't been played yet, and obviously it's been yeah. been postponed to next season. Uh, the draft took place at the end of last year, and I did a lot of work for them with regards to draft strategy. Looked at a number of areas such as player analysis, sort of desired skill sets of the players we were targeting, and trying to model what a new format might look like. Because I think that's yeah, well, it's quite underappreciated yeah. as well. You know, no one's played this 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 format of a hundred balls yet, so. You know, what's it going to be like? Is it going to be more like T20? Is it going to be more like T10? No, no one really knows yet. So, we're, so having that, having trying to provide some insight in that area was 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 something that I, that I thought was really important as well. Um, other teams like English Council don't really tend to publicise the teams that I work with, but um, a few listeners might have, have read the Cricketer article recently where um, I featured uh, about Matt Milnes and his rise at Kent. Um, so yeah. I got credit for recommending him to them. Uh, at the point that I recommended him to them, he hadn't actually he hadn't actually played a first team match for Knotts. He was at Knotts previously, um, but I was able to model his second team numbers to to mm. show that he had a considerable upside as yeah, a young player with 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 uh, ability. Uh, one season later, he's taken more than fifty wickets in Division One in Red Bull cricket. I think it was the highest English wicket taker in Division One, wow. and uh, yeah, and he's. Um, we got caught up for England, England Lions as well. So you know, taking, seeing, seeing a guy you recommend from the second team somewhere, and in, in, in one season, the improvement that they've made is just fantastic for like, job satisfaction, really. Right. 
Awesome. Okay. And I'll, I'll, um, we were talking just before we started recording um, about a, a podcast that you were, you were on uh, a little while ago now. Um, yeah. but you mentioned, obviously, yourself, you know, you mentioned how stressful it can be in the last sort of two or three years whilst you've been running a business. You're trying to um, essentially contact a lot of people where, you know, you can have a, a relatively low success rate in terms of hearing back or, or sort of working with these people. Um, I guess from a time management and sort of stress point of view, like how do you... Um, how do you manage things? And, and is it just a one-man show or do you have a small team that you work with? Yeah, so I'm on my own pretty much always. Um, I've got a home office. Um, so, yeah, but I do still, obviously I work with a team with regard, when I'm working with a, a, a team, I'm working with a team in terms of, um, yeah, draft planning and stuff like that. So I enjoy I enjoy that aspect of it as well. But, you know, 90% of the time, yeah, I'm, I'm on my own at home. Um, right. It's fine it gets a bit lonely sometimes but um yeah it, it's 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 good um, i enjoy being my own boss and and yeah from a time perspective though it's, it can be quite difficult i'm often in in the office before 7 a.m and kind of generally find that self-employed people either work too much or too little there's it's very hard to find that middle ground i'm probably in the, the work too hard camp most of the time um and yeah, I mean, it, it, you say it's quite stressful. Yeah, it is. I mean, financially, it's obviously, especially this current current situation with no sport at the moment, obviously, it's, that's that's even more difficult. But um, you know, you're relying on work coming in, invoices being paid quickly, stuff like that. You know, yeah. it's it's um, yeah. There's a lot. Of, there's a lot of things you need to consider before before doing this type of thing. Right, and um, we we were talking again. You know, I was mentioning with Sport Tech Daily. It's only been a couple of months since we've launched, but. I guess you tend to wear a lot of hats when you're working for yourself. Um, I told you I've run my own business for three years in, in tech recruitment and now with Sport Tech Daily and I was discussing some of my plans, but with wearing a lot of hats, does that is that a challenge in itself or have you sort of come into a, a good rhythm now with, with what you're doing? Yeah, managing time and resources is like a really critical thing. Um, I, was, I was pretty bad at this to start with, um, but over the last few years I've I've really put a lot of effort into to trying to be a lot more time efficient. Um, so, for example, I, I watch a lot of like YouTube videos, listen to podcasts and stuff, not just about sport, but like business, stuff like that as well. I was watching a YouTube video by a guy called Alec Torelli, who's a well-known poker player, pro poker player, and now he's a, a full-time coach as well. And, and he talked about making a to-do list to do daily in order of priority. And the first item should always be something that you can perform a job that you can perform pretty quickly and kind of gets you off off and running for the day and 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 starting the day well because you tick something off real quick and um yeah that approach really helped me um and it probably sounds a bit silly as well but but when i'm when i'm driving on my own sometimes i switch off all the music and and have what i call like a business meeting with myself um <laughs> my wife kind of like ridicules me for this but <laughs> it works well for me <laughs> i think you've got to do what works best for you you know i think i've realized in the last couple of months one thing that i do is as i just said when you're wearing different hats some of those hats are going to be things that you just just don't like doing so i've yeah. got this thing where i do a to-do list and i do something that i feel the most anxious about or uncomfortable about and i do that yeah. first um yeah, and look, it doesn't always work i went through a period where i put something off for like six days that i really should have done but um i think in general it's a great idea you just get that out of the way and you feel a lot more comfortable that you've got more enjoyment yeah. to do for the rest no of the definitely day. yeah 100 percent. yeah i think that kind of being able to you know work on that list and stuff is, is massive for me right and look um coronavirus you know it's the topic on everyone's mind at the moment especially with essentially the whole sporting world at the moment and, and the world in general put on hold how do you think it's going to impact the markets and i guess the the clubs and the organizations in the areas that you work with over the next six to 12 months yeah really good question um i think it's just so difficult to say really um i don't know i don't know what's around the corner i don't think anyone does really um the the media in england are talking about like, playing sport at what they call biosecure venues yeah. but that's got no crowds or anything like that but i'd imagine even organizing that would be pretty challenging mm. uh yeah obvious other difficulty with regards to sport um particularly cricket where where um there's a lot of international travel um either t20 tournaments do they, do they even have overseas players if they're going to take place how do countries organize international cricket with this in mind no one you know there's not really much international travel at the moment maybe there probably won't be for for a little bit of time to come still as well so right uh, yeah, there's a lot of logistical difficulties, I think, with regards to, to getting sport back on. Obviously, 
I'm sure everyone wants sport to come back as quickly as possible. Um, yeah. But obviously, it's got to be quite mindful about not people, putting people's health at risk as well. Right. And from a personal point of view, obviously, it's impacted you know your your work and your livelihood. Um, mm-hmm. I guess what's been your approach in terms of hey, look, there's no sport on. What do I do with my time? Yeah. So yeah, exactly. Exactly that. I mean, <laughs> there's not there's not much you can do. I've picked up a bit of work recently actually because. Um, a couple of teams got in touch and they wanted me to do some research for them and stuff. So that was that was absolutely fine. Um, I'm writing my book at the moment as well, so so that's that's a uh, a big time time resource. But it's it's worked out time yeah you know, time wise quite well for me because it, it, I wouldn't have had the time to be able to do this project if yeah. if, if I wasn't uh, if I was working in sport on a daily basis, you know. So I've been able to devote so much more time to. It. I've been planning to write a book for best part of two years but I kind of never really had the time to devote fully to, to doing it in, in such detail and, and, and it's, it is such a massive project that um yeah it's 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 kind of been been useful for me I suppose in some ways to throw like eight ten hours a day at writing a book whereas, whereas I would never have had that time to do it before right okay well look, without giving away too much can, can you tell us yeah. generally what what the book's about and, and what you're hoping to <laughs> I guess, um, get, get out for the viewers out of that? Yeah, no, sure. Um, I'm super excited about this book and I, I'm hoping that, that, that everyone who reads it will, will really enjoy and get a lot out of it as well. The book's called Strategies for Success in the Indian Premier League. Um, Ooh, so wow. essentially I'm writing in detail about high expectation recruitment on pitch strategies. And these, these are the things that teams should be implementing. Uh, of course they're sometimes doing it but a lot of the time they're not as well um, so I give you guys a flavour of, of, of what's in the book and some of the areas that I'm covering um, uh, one area that I look at a lot is establishing the drivers for success in this particular competition and how does that affect budget distribution at an auction so for example uh, research might find that a, high, a lot of rot- a rotational batsmen, you know, guys who aren't boundary hitters, but they res- rotate the strike a lot, so they have a high non-boundary strike rate, but a low boundary percentage, they're generally quite stability orientated. Uh, they, they, they might be overpriced in the market compared to, say, a high quality death bubbler. So that's something that an area that I focus on a lot. Um, for example, there's, there's local batsmen playing inside Mushtaq Ali Trophy. Uh, yeah, I, would, I, I kind of equate that to like one division below the IPL, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and these guys can do like a 80 or 90% similar job as a, a stability focused rotator type batsman, you know? So it kind of makes sense to teams to look at them as a, an option for like 50 lark kind of prices and, and then spend the, the money, the big money on like a premium death bowler or world class mm. all rounder who can. Uh, slaughter teams of the death of this, with the boundary hitting you know like um, guys like Russell or Hardy Pandya or something like that because um, there's a, there's scarce resources in the market these are premium death bowlers and high quality all rounders so it makes sense to value them more and then you can pick up the other parts of your team a lot cheaper because there's so much supply of them if that makes sense right yeah and the fact that teams sometimes spend like eight crore or more on like a rotational batsman or, or even worse an overseas one just completely mm. blows my mind to be honest with you um yeah. I, I i talk a lot about the book as well about the age curve dynamics stuff like that so looking at identifying when older players decline so currently as a collective ipl teams are spending 31 percent of their budgets on players aged 31 to 34 Wow. But these players only played 27% of IPL matches in the last two years. So there's a bit of a discrepancy of how much they're paying compared to how much they're actually being played. So a question I might ask of teams is, is, is whether they're holding on to highly paid big name potentially, who might potentially be a decline for like one retention too many, you know? Yeah. Um, should some of the older players have been released and not get IPL contracts earlier? Mm. Um, and a lot of the big names in Indian cricket are kind of getting towards or, or past peak age. So there's, there might have to be quite a big change in the future. Yeah. For example, you know, C- CSK are quite renowned for having an older, more experienced squad. Um, and, and while these players have, they've got so much more experience, and I think that's their kind of USP, if you like, um, that there will be a point where they, they decline so much that they will need to be replaced. And, and will this be at the next major auction? Will the next major auction even be next year? Because obviously, I think 2020 season has to be played before there is another major auction. So, yeah. 
no one really knows, but this, this stuff's up in the air. And, and I think teams need to be very aware of that age age improvement and age decline curve for, for younger players and older players and, and, and be quite mindful of, of, of releasing players at the right time before or at the point where their, their numbers decline. And, right. um, and, and, you know, on the subject of CSK as well, I talk a lot about venues and venue dynamics with team selection as well. So, uh, you know, Listeners who follow the the IPL a lot might might be aware that Chipork at Chinese Town Ground is, is really spin friendly, and and the difference in in spin and pace economy rates are just completely absurd there. Uh, mm-hmm. like spin goes for like just over six and over, and pace goes for almost nine and over. Now right. CSK are, are a formidable outfit at home, but that's not necessarily because their their pace. Oh, so their spin bowling numbers are, are a lot better than their opposition in terms of economy rate. It's not that much better than their opposition. They just bowl a lot more off, off spin at their home venue compared to the opposition teams. So, it, I mean, for example, it could be some stats. Like, they, out, out of the last nine games, so 2018-2019 season, since they got readmitted to IPL, they've bowled 70 balls of spin or more six out of nine times wow. at home. But the opposition teams who are away there have only bowled 70 balls or more of spin once. <laughs> so they haven't quite cottoned on to the conditions and, and how, how they should structure their team to play an away match you know, against, against Channel Super Kings. Uh, CSK bowled 58% of balls in spin in the last two seasons there at home. Opposition teams just 47%. So immediately there, there's just some basic stats that will tell you how you can approach the problem differently for an away match at Chipotle. Um, and you know, teams can't really say that that's because they don't have the the bowlers in their squad to do that. They do. Um, they just they just don't. They're, they're unaware of that. You know, every every IPL team's got like three or more three or more spinners in their squad. So yeah. it, it's a decision that they've consciously made not to take that spin approach away, even though the numbers are increasingly more in favour of bowling a lot of spin there. Right. Um, I mean, uh, another area that I talk about a bit in the book is the cricket's three point moment. So, in basketball, they kind of worked out that even with a lower success percentage, it was it was more higher expectation to go for three point shots a lot more, mm. and uh, the reward was worth it compared to the risk. And I, I talk about something that I've identified in cricket, which would be kind of comparable to this, but I don't really want to spoil it yet by yeah, saying course, much yeah. more than that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think you know, if, if that wasn't enough, like I think um, I've, I've checked out a few of your you know your previous podcast episodes, some of the content on your site. Um, definitely very keen to see this book. Is it going to be coming out in the next few months or is it still a little while away? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, I, I, I don't know if a formal release date yet, but I'm, I'm anticipating it won't be that far into the future. So, uh, yeah, awesome. definitely within the next few months. Yeah, yeah so, nice. Yeah. Okay. Well, in terms of, you know, the, the previous content that you've put out, I, I was mentioning to you that I've listened to some of it and it's, it's been really engaging and, and interesting. Um, what are some, I guess, resources that you would recommend in this sports analytics space that would be really good um, in terms of um, you know picking up the skills or picking up the experience and the lessons from other people in this in the industry that you find really insightful. Yeah, I, good question. I find it quite difficult to answer this because um, I'm pretty much self-taught with everything that I've done. So so yeah, no, don't, no doubt I read analytics articles a lot. Um, not necessarily about cricket though. There are usually mm. in other sports like soccer, base, uh, baseball example where i find that the industry is a lot more developed than cricket i don't yeah. my my view is i i yeah i read cricket content but i, I i'm not massively infused by the, the current level of content generally yeah. um so i'd rather read stuff in other sports and then look at how that might be able to be applied to cricket right. uh, comparisons and, and different approaches to solve problems and stuff like that so uh, for example, I read a lot of stuff by like 21st Club, Stats Bomb, Market Insights in, in soccer, who, mm. who provides some interesting content that helps me kind of think about those different solutions to, to a cricketing problem, if you like. Yeah. Um, I read a lot of books as well. I think we were talking about this, this before, before we went, went live. Um, a couple I've read recently include um, Football Hackers and Done Deal in soccer. Um, so Football Hackers talks a, a lot about the journey of analytics in football and, and how it might develop in the future. Um, Done deal focuses more on like the business of football with a particular focus on like agents and stuff like that and sort of general general managers and stuff like that as well, you know, directors of football, for example. Um, 
at the moment I'm reading the MVP machine, which is a baseball analytics book, but that with, with the, the kind of recruitment market so, so efficient in, in baseball. Now they're looking at using data analytics to, to look at how to improve players instead. So it's kind of an interesting alternative perspective and maybe a, a vision into how cricket might you know, come in the future, you know? Right. Awesome. Okay. Well, look, it's, it's been super interesting learning a lot more about your background. You know, you've got your online poker days, you've got your tennis and your cricket knowledge, you know, working with clubs firsthand. You've got a, a really impressive, I guess, a range of experience. I'm really interested to read this book, but one, um, one question I love to ask at the end, you know, considering your, your broad range of experience, who's one, you know, club or player that you would like to work with, with your skill set, and what would you help them improve? I love this question. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I mean, I would like to think I could help any team in the world with with, with you know, improve their processes. But I think, as I it's a good question. Uh, two teams, probably yeah. Lahore Calendars and PSL, and RCB. I think one of your previous guests listened to some old podcasts. They picked RCB as well, so maybe it might be yeah. quite a popular answer. Um, I mean, Lahore, for example, they 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 came bottom of the PSL every season until this year and obviously that wasn't even a complete season either so mm. taking a team from the bottom to the top would be, be an awesome project and, and I actually don't think it would be that, that tough because their pace bowling attack's got the potential to be incredible but in my opinion they kind of need to do a lot of work on their overseas recruitment with regards to overseas batsmen in particular so you know quite a few people have realised that in PSL focusing on, on quality above average boundary hitters is, is as overseas batsmen and then looking at domestic bowlers is just makes complete sense based on on the resources available in the market yeah. and you know it wouldn't be that difficult to generate a short list of overseas batsmen for them so yeah set up a few database filters models some expected data and and and, and yeah i think that i'll be able to improve them quite a lot um yeah. rcb just pretty because i can't understand how they haven't realized after all this time that spending a high percentage of their team budget on batsmen is usually a really bad strategy yeah. Um, it, you know, it wouldn't be that tough, for example, to, to identify a few death bowlers who would really improve them. I think that's something that they've really struggled with over over recent years. And mm. also, they, they don't bowl enough spin. I mean, we spoke about that in Chennai previously. But, I mean, spin is more economical than pace at almost every venue in the IPL. And, you know, also it takes wickets at a reasonably comparable force per wicket rate as well. So... While we can argue about right, the long-term implications of this, you know, so um, it's, it can be quite cyclical in terms of the sort of spin and pace balance, if you like. Um, uh, you know, for example, if, if teams start bowling more and more spin, then there's going to be the potential for a sharp, a sharp increase in the value of batsmen who a strong score is going to spin to counter that or... Yeah. or um, batsmen are just going to try and self-improve so that they can ensure that they can compete in the more of a sign of spin for any background but mm. at the moment the <laughs> rcb just don't bowl enough spin current so we're talking about a current problem and that's something that they probably need to address and right. you know a lot of teams in recent years are really upping their percentage of spin bowled to really good effect so we mentioned csk also that guy on amazon warriors in caribbean premier league uh, lancashire in england in the t20 blast the the uh, but RCB have actually dropped their spin percentage of balls bowled in the last few seasons. So uh, the economy rate at Chinnaswamy, their home ground, is like just over one run and over uh, less for spinners than it is for paces. So they've got that scope to really bowl a lot of spin. In 2017, they did do that and they, they bowled almost 50% of, of overs bowled by spin. But then this has fallen into the, the kind of mid 30% in the last two years. So right. um they're pretty low numbers for for an IPL team over those last two years. So, and you know, their their team bowling economy as well in 2017 was better than average, but then it's below average in the last two years, and that's because they dropped a lot of uh, you know, the spin overs that they've bowled. So, these are quite solvable problems that you can implement with a team really quite straightforwardly to to improve them and to 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 you know, to hopefully change their fortunes really. <laughs> right. Well, I think uh, we're referring to the the podcast episode with Gaurav um, from ESPN Cricket Info. And I think just hearing you guys talk is sort of making me really excited about the future of, of T20 cricket analytics. I think, look, it's it's probably going to take some time, especially in the next couple of years. Um, but I think you know having such great minds in the industry already is only going to help. So, um, look, um, thanks for coming on, Dan. Really appreciate the chat. Um, and we'll we'll have all your details when we put the video out. So if people want to reach out to you directly, they'll be able to do that. And uh, 
looking forward to your upcoming book as well. Perfect. Thanks so much. Really enjoyed doing this. Looking forward to, to having a listen when it's ready. Excellent. Cheers, Dan. Hope you enjoyed this episode. If you'd like to check out more of our content, go to sporttechdaily.com or follow us on social media across Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook or Instagram.